Hi, I'm Evan Perkins, Managing Director of Consulting Services at CES. And today we'll be providing an update on the issue of fuel security for the New England region as we head into this coming winter. The fuel security uh, is something that we've talked about with our clients here coming up uh, on a number of years. Uh, this is now a recurring theme and topic at the annual CES seminar. Uh, most recently this spring, we talked about what happened uh, last winter in the grid on Texas, the widespread outages there, and whether there were any lessons learned for the New England region coming out of that. As we think about this winter, uh, there's been some fundamental changes in the gas market specifically for New England uh, over the last six months uh, that pose some troubling concerns around some of the fundamental issues that cause fuel security risks for the region. It's a long way of saying that there are a couple points that CES is paying really close attention to uh, in terms of grid operations as we look at the coming months. Would want to stress at the outset here that ISO New England uh, over the last number of months uh, has claimed that they believe they are in a good state for winter preparedness, that they feel like they'll be able to operate the grid reliably throughout the coming winter. So this session is certainly not intended to scare folks, uh, but this issue for this winter specifically, there are some interesting uh, components uh, to the issue that are a bit unique compared to prior years and future years. So it definitely has CES paying attention to this closely. To quickly recap uh, some of the discussion we had on fuel security uh, at this May's uh, CES annual seminar, last February, uh, Texas saw widespread grid outages uh, following an extreme cold spell uh, that blanketed most of the state. The, the graph at the bottom of the slide here shows the, the different types of power plant outages that added up in mid-February during this cold spell, uh, totaling about 50 gigawatts at its peak over a multi-day period when millions of customers lost electricity service. Just as a reference point, 50 gigawatts is a massive amount of power plant capacity. It's about 40% of total power plant capacity in the state. It's about double the peak demand we had this past summer in New England. So it just as an order of magnitude, it is quite large and this was a pretty devastating event. So coming out of this uh, event, there's been a number of sort of postmortems and lessons learned uh, both at the state and federal level. We've seen efforts to really accelerate uh, the finalization and implementation of cold weather standards for the grid, especially for parts of the country where cold events are infrequent. We've seen these come into place. And actually last week, the Texas Public Utility Commission uh, approved unanimously uh, cold weather standards to implement for the, the power fleet in Texas. So there's been a lot of activity happening uh, in Texas and Southern US since this uh, event last winter. One of the things we talked a lot about in that seminar in May was how the lessons learned from the Texas disaster uh, apply to New England. Uh, in Texas, the root cause of a lot of the power plant failures uh, was a lack of winterization of key components within both the fuel infrastructure serving power plants, the operational infrastructure within plants, and then the delivery infrastructure that's used to get power from those plants to end users. In New England, we are in a good position overall with our key energy infrastructure in terms of winterization. We've made uh, the necessary investments to make sure our gas and electric infrastructure uh, is generally protected uh, from extreme cold, uh, primarily because it is much more of a frequent risk for us uh, in this part of the country. For New England, our fuel security concerns really relate to the ability to get gas into the region uh, over pipelines on the coldest days of the winter when there's competing demand for gas for both space heating and power generation. This issue has been really exacerbated over the last 10 years as gas uh, has emerged as the dominant generation fuel in the region, displacing a lot of the coal and or replacing a lot of the coal and oil fired generation, the older power fleet that has retired, including some nuclear as well. So when we talk about fuel security for New England, it's that issue of what do we do to make sure we have a reliable grid on those days where we can't get enough gas to fuel sort of the primary 
tool we have in the power generation fleet, those gas generators. This is a, a graph we show and revisit quite a bit. This is a, a map of the interstate pipeline system for gas serving the New England region. Uh, as you can see, there are five primary pathways to get natural gas through underground pipelines into the six states of New England. Uh, we have Algonquin and Tennessee from the south and the west, Iroquois uh, and TransCanada slash PNGTS from the north, and we have uh, Maritimes coming down in to Maine from New Brunswick and connecting now uh, into Massachusetts, we're able to now flow gas north to south on that line. When we have really cold days, there's enough gas demand within the six states plus power plant demand for gas to exceed the pipeline capacity total coming into the region. These pipelines, when they're fully operating and at capacity, uh, we have about five BCF a day of gas import capacity to the region. On those coldest days when there's the competing demand for gas, we can have demand exceed six BCF a day. So we're order of magnitude of BCF short that needs to be either backfilled by liquefied natural gas or reduced by fuel switching specifically to oil. So this issue of just not physically being able to get enough gas to meet current demand levels, we have to solve for that BCF plus you know, shortfall. And again, the backstop to do that is either bringing in liquefied natural gas into one of the three import terminals, two of which are in the Boston area. One is in Canaport, as shown on the map here up in New Brunswick, or we have to have power plants and or end users switch from gas to fuel oil, which is a more expensive fuel and has more carbon emissions, which complicates the six states efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions overall. So when we think about what this means, both in terms of reliable grid operations, but also for market pricing, our customers see for both natural gas and electricity, this really dictates electric prices because gas is the marginal fuel for the majority of hours in New England in the electric fleet. This is really a challenge. It creates a sort of a high price volatility for suppliers and customers in the winter months and therefore, when customers want to go out and fix pricing for either electricity or natural gas in any of the six states, that volatility in the winter raises prices across the board when you, if you want to look at sort of a fixed price option covering uh, the whole year. On the back of this dynamic of sort of uncertainty of how frequently or often we have to go to these more expensive sort of backstop options, i.e. LNG or fuel oil. Um, over the last six months, we've seen a number of other factors in the gas market emerge that have really raised prices uh, and concerns about this winter volatility. The graph here shows futures pricing uh, for buying gas at Algonquin City Gate, which is basically the interstate pipeline point in Boston. A heating dominant customer uh, was able to buy gas on an annual basis between four and five dollars for this coming couple of years, 2022 to 2025, if you look back over the last year or so. Over the last six months, though, that four to five dollar per MMBTU price has really skyrocketed, in particular for the near term. You can see now that for 2022, buying that same years worth of gas will cost you more than $10 per MMBTU. Again, if you're a heating dominant customer who uses most of your gas during the winter months. So this points to a couple factors going on. Uh, Keith and Chris talked about this during the last newsletter. Uh, one, domestically and looking across the country, we haven't seen gas production in the US keep up with sort of rebounding demand following uh, the demand impacts of COVID uh, last spring. So we have sort of lagging demand, um, sorry, lagging production, not meeting you know, rising demand that naturally will raise prices. We also see uh, basically us drawing down storage levels uh, as we head into the winter. We're now quite a bit below the five-year storage average nationally, which hasn't helped prices either. For New England, though, a lot of this price, uh, price spike that we're seeing in the near term is driven by uncertainty and concerns about how often we're gonna to have to go to the backstop options for electric generation uh, during this coming winter, you know, that LNG price and fuel oil price. 
and moving forward, you know, what the price of this scarce natural gas will look like in the winter months. So these factors, when they all combine together, they're having real pricing impacts and cost impacts for our customers and the, the, those impacts need to be managed well. But also these point to uh, some concerns fundamentally that with the scarce fuel in the winter months, are we going to be able to continue meeting both space heating demand and electric generation needs reliably? And that really is the fuel security conundrum that we've been talking about for years now. So thinking about the two backstop solutions we use in New England to keep the grid running in the winter months, again, there's a couple things that CES is really paying close attention to this coming winter, both around reliable grid operations, but also in terms of how winter pricing for electricity and gas uh, sort of evolves as we head into the future based on some of these changed market dynamics. The first backstop point is LNG. Uh, so again, we can take liquefied natural gas into the region, either through Canaport in New Brunswick or the two locations in Boston. We have District Gas and Northeast Bowie. The competing market, though, for LNG has really fundamentally changed here over the last six months or so. The graph here shows uh, prices for LNG in red and orange across uh, the ocean, basically what the spot price for LNG is in Asia and in Europe. That price has risen from the five to $10 range to now exceed basically 30 to $40 per MMBTU. So the question, when you look at the global LNG market, if other buyers out there are willing to pay such a high premium for LNG now, what does it mean for suppliers of LNG who are thinking about delivering LNG on a spot basis into New England? Most LNG deliveries into New England are on a spot basis. They aren't under firm contracts. So as a market, we are subject to these sort of global fundamentals and these higher prices overseas will naturally call for higher prices here. So heading into this winter, we're paying close attention to how much LNG is flowing through the three terminals but also what we can glean, uh, especially from gas and electricity pricing, what that LNG uh, might be costing, seeing as uh, the global market has really surged and spiked here. The other factor we're paying close attention to heading into the winter is how much uh, oil is making up of the generation fleet for electricity. Uh, Typically, you don't see oil in the generation fleet when uh, we have limited or minor gas constraints. Uh, Gas is a much cheaper fuel with our proximity to the Marcellus Shale in the mid-Atlantic. However, if we can't get enough gas into the region, we do have to rely on either uh, diesel fuel or residual fuel to power a generation fleet that can either fuel switch or the older plants that run basically on bunker fuel. So if we start the winter and see basically oil generation being part of the mix, uh, much more outside of these really cold days, it's gonna be a really concerning factor, uh, both for future pricing for customers, if we're gonna have to run these more expensive fuels outside of constraint days, that is not a good story. Uh, But also from an emissions standpoint, all six states are essentially uh, trying to uh, move towards long-term emissions cuts like economy wide, if we have to turn sort of the clock back and re- rely on oil for the winter months, uh, it's super counterproductive uh, to the other decarbonization efforts we're making, for example, you know, electrifying uh, space heating and transportation. So we're keeping a close eye specifically on the oil market. We have heard from suppliers uh, of oil that they are running into trucking shortages right now. Uh, so that's another point that uh, hearing how how well uh, that oil supply chain holds up to be able to serve these power plants among their other customers. Uh, this is a, a bit of a concerning facet heading into the winter. Again, ISO New England uh, feels comfortable uh, with where we stand overall, but we need to keep a close eye on this. So in summary, uh, these couple factors, in particular LNG and oil, these are really required require us uh, to keep a close eye on what happens for this coming winter. This will dictate whether the pricing surges we're seeing in the electricity market for New England and the gas market for New England can potentially abate in the coming years, the coming winters. And just from a reliability standpoint, um, ISO New England feels that we're prepared for this winter. 
uh, but we do just run into the physical constraints of getting fuel into the region based on our current power mix. So we're going to need to keep a close eye to make sure these LNG and oil backstop options can continue operating uh, as they're intended to.